As we draw 2019 to a close, we look back on all the great DLC that has come our way, from the Prophet and the Warlock all the way to the most recent Shadow and the Blade. Dark Elves, Lizardmen, Skaven, all of them have had pretty awesome additions to their rosters and campaigns, but there is one Warhammer 2 faction that has not been touched since the Queen of the Crone, the High Elves, my personal favorite of all the Warhammer races. Mainly because I wake up in the morning and drink tea while talking about the bygone days of colonial imperialism, but also because who doesn't like awesome phallic hats? Today we're going to talk about my speculation for the first big DLC of 2020. The Prince and the Paunch, or maybe the Warden and the Wah. I, I, I haven't really decided. Uh, those are my working titles for now, and even though I'm sure they will evolve throughout this video as I think of better names, I think they're a good place to start. The focus of this DLC will be on the High Elves, being led by Eltharian the Grim, and Greenskins, led by Grom the Paunch. And we're going to talk about why I think these two are the big choices for the next DLC on the horizon. Uh, strictly speaking, High Elves are just next in line when it comes to DLCs. Uh, we've seen the Lizardmen showcased twice, back to back, and both the Dark Elves and Skaven given additional DLC content. The High Elves have only been touched once, no pun intended, with the addition of Alariel and Alithanar. When we look at the previous DLC for Warhammer 2, we know that we're getting a Game 2 race, bare minimum. Now, the second race is either a Warhammer 2 or Warhammer 1 race as the uh, Hunter and the Beast brought the Empire to the Vortex campaign, as well as the Shadow and the Blade, giving us Bretonia via the FLC. Looking at some of the comments that CA has made regarding the Greenskins, I think that they are a very strong contender for this second DLC slot. Uh, having remarked that Old World updates will be con a consistent part of DLC patches, we can be sure to see a massive overhaul to another Game 1 race with this DLC. This is further substantiated by the claim that the Shadow and the Blade purposely skipped over Old World updates in lieu of some quality of life updates of the game, namely the vastly improved end turn times for both Vortex and Mortal Empires. The only races that have not gotten their update are Wood Elves, Beastmen, Greenskins, and Warriors of Chaos. I truly believe that Warriors of Chaos will be tied into a Game 3 uh, lean-in or just the pre-order bonus, something of the sort. So I'm going to exclude them from this list, leaving us with the aforementioned 3. Another remark came out of CA informing us that Greenskins will get an early 2020 update, making them the frontrunner in my mind. So, this is why my speculation for the next DLC is High Elves and Greenskins. Um, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I wanted you to be able to follow along with my chain of thought on this before we dive into each race. Now, the way I'm going to structure this video is very similar to the video that I did on Throt and Thoric. One, we'll discuss one faction at a time, going through possible legendary lords that could be added, so on and so forth. Two, then touch on the units that might accompany said lords, as well as my ideas for how they could be implemented into the game. Three, talk about any new proposed faction mechanics that would play into the selected lords units, overhauls, reworks, anything like that. And then four, lastly, the starting location for that faction. Just a quick disclaimer here before we move into the speculation, this is not a lore video. Uh, I have covered these guys in their own respective lore videos that I'll link in the corresponding sections, so I apologize if I kind of skim over some of the units quickly without diving deep on the rich lore behind them. But let's take this massive hype train out of the station with the Greenskins. So using the blueprint from our previous speculation video, let's talk a bit about the propo proposed name for the faction coming in a DLC like this. Now this plays heavily into my idea about renaming all the Greenskin factions, and we've seen a taste of this with the last Festag patch dubbed Potion of Speed. Creative Assembly remarked that Empire, Greenskins, Dwarfs, all those generic race-based faction names stems from an old naming mechanic from Game 1. This has obviously changed in Game 2, where every faction is named after their respective Legendary Lord's starting position, or a faction name that kind of pays homage to that Lord. And that kind of leads, uh, or the lore that leads them at least. So on that, I'd like to see all of the Greenskins factions renamed again to their respective WA. At the very least, their respective tribe, uh, which would actually be a bit of a challenge for, say, Grimgore Ironhide. But I know they just got a rename, you know, as Grimgore the Black to, uh, or Grimgore to uh, Black Crag, but I think it's a bit too simple in my mind. I'd love to see Grom the Paunch's faction named simply WA Grom 
And that's the way they were marked um, on the grander Warhammer world, as they refer to each major greenskin incursion across the old world. You've got Wa Grom, Wa Gorbad, Wa Skarsnik. Each one of these has its own kind of, um, it's almost like its own crusade attached to it. And I think that that would play very well into kind of creating a lot more character for each one of these. It would also be very easy to find them on like a custom battle or an empire, or I'm sorry, a uh, co-op campaign list because they'd be at the end alphabetically. So with that though, you can see all of my proposed units, lords, heroes, everything for the Greenskins. Taking a look at uh, Wa Grom, the proposed faction name for Grom the Paunch, you can see he would be the legendary lord that would lead this. An FLC lord option uh, would be Gorbad Ironclaw, and we're not going to dive too deep on him, it's just a kind of a quick name um, drop right there. I have done a, a lore video on him as well, but he has a lot of really awesome lore behind him. You know, he is the uh, one of the first real big Waz for the Greenskins. He was the one that took out Solon. There's a lot of really cool lore behind him, and while he is kind of a generic seeming lord, he would be one that would be very support oriented or buffing of troops oriented, and he has a really badass model. But taking a look then into the uh, heroes and generic legendary lords, again guys, this is just a real quick summary before we dive into each one, what their mechanics would look like, so on and so forth. This is just kind of that high level overview. So our generic legendary lord would be an orc great shaman. We don't have anything like that on the legendary lord list, only um, night goblin, or I'm sorry, night goblin, uh, a goblin great shaman, not an orc. Then furthering into that, into the hero section, we would have an orc big boss. Now jumping into the units, so the way I've broken this down is I always provide around six or so units. And we more often than not are not going to see six units added in a DLC. So the way I've kind of themed this is the first three that we're going to go through are the most likely to come in the DLC, either because they're missing from the army book as is, or they just play a lot of, um, play into a lot of the weaknesses of the, the current armies as is. And those first three are the Goblin Spear Chucka, simply put, it's just a bolt thrower, a Snotling Pump Wagon, which I think would be pretty fun, then a Feral Wyvern. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Now there's three other things here that I think play into the current, I guess you could say DLC meta, quote unquote, of how things have been released in the past two, three DLCs. Um, a Rogue Idol of Gork and or Mork, um, Colossal Squigs, then Hill Goblins. Hill Goblins might be a little more likely along with the, the previous three, but I think Hill Goblins would be a lot of fun and, and they're very different from your normal kind of goblin. Then our last one, our bonus kind of unit that would be not necessarily added as part of a DLC, but added as part of the FLC patch portion of this DLC would be Troll and Black Orc variants because we've talked this uh, through to the ground and I think it really is worth bringing up in a speculation video that goes into the green skins, what might be coming with them, so on and so forth. So again, this is a very high level of everything that I am proposing with a um, Wa Grom faction. Let's jump into our lords, then our heroes, then our units. Starting off, of course, with the big boy himself, Grom the Paunch, the real thickens here. So he is evidently, obviously, a goblin war boss. Now, in the lore, the way that he kind of got so big is he ate an entire plate of raw troll meat, and this kind of mutated him, and he has a voracious appetite, and he gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the way I would kind of see this represented in Total War is that he is a goblin war boss, but with a better stat line, representing that bigger girth of him, just the, uh, the big old thickens that he is. Now, in addition to that, he would start on his goblin wolf chariot. Now, we don't have a precedent of lords starting with mounts until Raponce was added. With Raponce, she immediately starts on her horse. So, why not have uh, Grand the Paunch start on his goblin wolf chariot? I think that for the proposed starting locations for uh, Grom here, it does make a lot of sense because he will have the deck stacked against him pretty hard. That's going to play very well into his campaign effects. Uh, he's going to obviously be giving bonuses to goblins, goblin chariots, wolf riders, uh, recruitment ranks for goblin heroes, bonuses to fighting elves, leadership and melee attack centric at least. Um, in the in the tabletop, he had a a rule called eats elves for breakfast, in which case the greenskins, which had an innate fear towards elves, were no longer subject to it. So it was kind of a cool way to break that rule. Since we don't have that, I think that a great way to translate that would be Grom's Wa as a specific unique skill line. This would give him bonuses against elves, similar to how Raponce gives bonuses against undead. And just how Raponce gives bonus to all undead, I think it would be the same thing for uh, Grom. 
Uh, I think he's going to be dealing with high elves, dark elves, maybe even wood elves with um, any kind of smattering in between, depending on where he's at, mortal empires or vortex. And I think to Grom the Paunch, elves are elves. Pointy ears are pointy ears. He doesn't care. He's going to fight them harder, better, faster, whatever the Kanye West song is. But with, the, with those mechanics in mind, I think he's going to have two quest items, or he would have two quest items. One, Lucky Banner. Uh, this is uh, straight out of the book here. It's a pretty easy translation, but I would say this would be his first quest item, and it grants a ward save to Grom, leadership benefits, and recruitment bonuses for goblin units in campaign, uh, maybe as a, as a fun little passive. And the second one would be Axe of Grom, a second quest item. Now this would grant magic attacks, increased weapon strength, and melee attack, also give bonuses, or uh, give bonus weapon strength and melee attack for his army when fighting elves. The Lord uh, directly states that this axe is so infused with wa energy that it can really empowers Grom. And I think that that would be a real cool way to do it is that not only is he going to help out uh, himself in fighting elves, the axe of Grom will help out his army. Because like I said, he's probably going to have that deck stacked against him very heavily based off of the two uh, kind of starting locations, two, three starting locations I have in mind. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of just kind of go over those when we get there. But this kind of sums up our legendary lord with Grom the Paunch. And before we move over to our hero section and our generic legendary lords, I just want to give a massive shout out to Weapon Master 470 for creating another custom bat banner for us here. Now this one is for um, Grom the Paunch and his actual um, faction, that was in the lore at least, the Broken Axe Tribe. So this could be the faction... Uh, Wa Grom or the faction Broken Axe Tribe, either one, but I think that uh, this would at least be the symbol we would see in game if Grom the Paunch were to be added. All right, so our generic legendary lore that would be added with Grom, I'm saying, would be a orc great shaman, uh, just a generic Wurzog. There's nothing special about this guy that really merits a whole ton of conversation here. Uh, it mainly is going to be bring, bringing uh, the big Wa to the Lord section. Uh, outside of the legendary lords, of course. Also, it grants you some some fun mount options. I think Orc Boar makes a lot of sense. Orc Boar Chariot also. And I think it'd be fun to also place these on a Wyvern. I think it just kind of makes sense for uh, what we see with uh, some of the other characters in the Greenskins roster. Which brings us over to our generic hero. And again, a very simple one here. The Orc Big Boss. This would be your hero level Orc War Boss. Orc War Boss, of course, being the Lord. Now, I think that the way this has to be done is kind of a high defensive stat guardian type character. We get this a lot with the kind of warrior class hero we get from all of the other factions for the most part. Taking a look at the master, the, the noble, the paladin, all of them kind of have this very um, bodyguard like mentality to them. And I think that the big boss can also play into that, especially if the mount options for it match the great shaman. And if you kind of think of the overall narrative of Grom the Paunch, Grom the Paunch is so big that even orcs listen to him. And an orc big boss would be a really cool kind of right hand or right tusk. I don't, I don't know what orcs say. They're disgusting. Um, to Grom the Paunch in that he would be able to ride an orc boar so he can ride alongside Grom the Paunch. An orc boar chariot so he can definitely ride alongside Grom the Paunch. Or a wyvern. He can fly over Grom the Paunch. So... Those three options for mounts, I think, bring a lot of fun and character to the generic hero class of an orc big boss. And our first proposed unit would be the Goblin Spear Chucka. This is missing directly from the 8th edition army book. And this is very simple here. I think it would be a goblin-centric, anti-large AP bolt thrower unit. Um, I don't think that it would have different firing modes like we have with the repeater or the eagle claw bolt thrower. I just think it would be strictly an anti-large, um, straight shot bolt thrower. Um, I think that the big caveat here is that it would be, ha or it would have a higher rate of fire than your normal bolt, thr bolt thrower, but just be less accurate. And typically, if you're taking a look at from a, um, at least a competitive standpoint, you use bolt throwers often to snipe out artillery pieces. So it can be kind of an interesting mechanic here because you're gonna, you want that high rate of fire just churning into units. And if you think about uh, Grand the Paunch firing into a ton of high elves. It makes a lot of sense because these things are just going to dish out tons of AP anti-large shots, which might not be the most accurate, but at least they'll kind of hit the hit home more often than not, hopefully. Our next unit is another missing unit from the army book, the Snotling Pump Wagon. So this is a bit different of a chariot. It's a chariot that has an explosion effect. And the way this worked in tabletop was that as you ram into things, you have your impact, um, impact hits 
and you can even upgrade those impact hits to do more. I think it has to be a bit different though when we're talking about Total War Warhammer. So for one, it would have anti-infantry, you know, as to be expected, uh, but rather than detonating like, say, a bloated corpse, it has a bound ability called Explodin' Spores that does high AP damage that inflicts poison. That's the way I kind of, or at least think, how a Snotling Pump Wagon could be done, with a 60 second recast that either can only burn down, or I guess it can only knock down time on that if you're out of combat or if you're in combat. I haven't decided which makes the most sense. I think that forcing a um, chariot thing or a chariot unit like this to stay in combat can be a little dangerous. You have that with the the black coach and it's and it's kind of deadly. Even though the black coach does get stronger as it stays in combat, it doesn't have the best stats for persistent combat. And in my mind, the Snotling Pump Wagon, um, it's got to speed up as it gets closer to the target on the charge, kind of like what we get with the Bloated Corpse, but I think just a little bit more tweaked. And on top of that, since it has such a, a wide-ranging blasting effect that it can continuously use, maybe it has like a two or three charge limit on it, um, it would need to have something to counteract that. So a slow melee or a low melee defense or, and or armor as a result. And if that's the case, I think that the uh, recast on Exploding Spores recharging in combat, it, it just kind of, it's too much in addition to the, the uh, low melee defense and armor. So I'd say uh, Exploding Spores can recycle as long as it's not in combat. And then when it is in combat, again, it can just blow up and just do a ton of AP damage. And the reason I'm saying a lot of AP damage has to kind of come out from these units is I'm saying these are relatively low tech units. The Goblin Spear Chuck, uh, in my mind, would be the very first siege engine you can get access to for the uh, for the Greenskins. And the Snotling Pump Wagon in the same, in the same kind of uh, scope might be a tier two chariot because it does have such a uh, damning effect but i think that there has to be a way for grom the paunch to field um semi-elite units to combat a lot of the high elf elite units or at least strong high elf units that they'll get right out the gate moving into our third unit here clear and simple on this one uh just a simple feral wyvern just give me that wyvern without a mount um, give it some AP, poison attacks, and have a cause terror. Uh, maybe even have a little bit lower leadership like we typically see with any feral iteration of any beast. But I just think that that is something that the Greenskins need. The Greenskins have always been a quote-unquote monster faction, and they don't really have a lot of monsters to bring to the table. So I think the Feral Wyvern is a good first step. Now, I know I said the first three units are probably ones that are most likely to make it into the game if a DLC like this were to land, but I think this one still has a lot of staying power. Uh, hill goblins, or sometimes called great goblins, are bigger, meaner, nastier, nasty skulkers. Um, essentially, I kind of look at them as an early tech upgrade for great axe infantry. When you kind of take a look at uh, red crested skinks, you kind of get access to this great axe infantry, which gives you AP damage and frenzy early in the tech tree for lizardmen, rather than having to wait all the way to temple guard, which gives you AP anti large halberd units. So, the way I kind of look at it is Hill go or, um, Red Crested Skinks are to Temple Guard as Hill Goblins are to Black Orcs. And maybe the uh, Hill Goblins actually do bring some anti-large to the table, AP and anti-large to help counter a lot of the larger monsters, or at least a lot of the larger things you're going to deal with against the High Elves. If you think about the early portions of a Greenskin campaign, you only have access to Goblin Spearmen right out the gate. You have to start going towards big uns. You have to start going towards any of the cavalry with spears to threaten large things. I mean, yeah, you're going to get your spear chuckas, but I, I still think there kind of has to be something in a Goblin-esque roster for Grom so that he can combat against Silverhelms. Um, dragon Princes, all the many dragons, all of the uh, phoenixes that he's going to deal with in droves in a campaign centered around fighting high elves. So now that we're, we, we're, we're talking about stuff that's likely, let's dip into the uh, Monstrous Arcanum, or at least things that are just very, very out there, but I still think are, are green skin related and would make a lot of sense. So our first one is the Rogue Idol, or um, the Rogue Idol of Gork or Mork, whichever you want to classify it as. So think of this thing almost as like a like a hero titan, but green skins and made of rock, basically. So slow moving, high defense, and I even think you could give it a bound spell. Vindictive Glare or the Gaze of Mork, whichever you want to kind of theme it across. Um, and I think one of the biggest things, though, is that this thing has to have a high charge, um, a high charge bonus, I'm sorry. Um, in the Monstrous Arcanum, it kind of had something similar to that. 
and every time I got into combat, you would essentially lose control of it. So give it a high charge bonus, have it have rampage. So the second it gets into combat, it immediately rampages, which again, that is a hindering portion of this thing. But I think that since it'll be so defensive and it'll have such strong bound abilities that making it rampage with a high charge bonus gives it a little bit more to it. And I think that on top of it, if you give it an aura that buffs up melee attack and weapon strength to units around it, it will kind of help justify why it's rampaged as a means to kind of balance it out. You can't control where this thing goes to stack up a ton of your units. Your units have to follow it on its rampage through the enemy. And I think that that's kind of a fun one because it brings a very large, uh, very defensive unit to the roster that High Elves would have to knock down or destroy before they can really get into the rest of the Greenskin army. And it kind of acts as this big uh, prow to kind of bulldoze through a, a, a High Elf army in a very fun, different way than we've seen with Greenskins in, in any iteration that I can think of. Moving into another unit from the Monster Arcanum, we got the Colossal Squigs. Now this is playing off of the large creatures we've seen added to the game lately. Uh, give it the ability to, um, I guess you could say, something similar to Vampire's Hunger where it regenerates when it's in combat because it's eating its foes, um, have it cause terror, give it a decent amount of armor, not not too much, because again, this thing is just big scaly skinned, um, and make it quite fast. I think that that would be the, the big kind of um, differentiator, I guess you could say, when you take a look at, say, a Dread Saurian compared to a Colossal Squig. Yeah, the Colossal Squig, pound for pound isn't going to be doing as much damage, but it can move around so quickly because it's leaping with each and every jump. And maybe that in, in turn gives it a really good um, uh, charge bonus, perhaps even a bound ability where it can jump up and slam down on its ass. That, that is me just spitballing. That is not, <laughs> I swear that's not in a book anywhere, but I could see it having something like that. And squigs are a very bouncy little creature. You don't just see them kind of walking like a normal biped. So I think that there has to be something that plays upon that leap that they are, uh, that's just kind of a part of their gait. And maybe it's just, again, a faster speed, a bound ability, whatever it is. But I think that it's um, a great way to bring larger creatures into the greenskin rosters, just like the rogue idol, right? I think that's what's so important about the greenskins is that they are treated like a monstrous faction. They're supposed to have access to all these big beasts. And what do you really get? I mean, you get giants and arachnorock spiders, but I want there to be a little bit more here. And that's why I think colossal squigs and rogue idols make a lot of sense. Now, our last unit is again, a bit of a bonus here. It's not an actual set unit. And we're gonna expand on this towards the end when I talk about the overhaul for the greenskins as a whole. But I think that the, the variant or something that we need added to the Greenskins would be more on an FLC basis, and it would be Troll and Black Orc variants. I think we desperately need a variety to the top tier infantry of the Greenskins, as well as Trolls. So many variants of both in the uh, tabletop that I think it's kind of cheating them not to have it. Uh, the, uh, the Black Orcs have an ability called Arm to the Teeth, so you really don't get that sense of that because they just have great axes in this game. So spears, choppers, shields, uh, more variety onto the Black Orcs, I think, is going to be key. In addition to that, trolls uh, make rock trolls, river trolls, mountain trolls, all different variants so that you get, again, trolls that have different, quote-unquote, use cases, situations that you want them to thrive in. Uh, maybe, okay, the, the river troll um, is going to give you access to a, a venomous breath attack similar to Throg. Or a rock troll is going to be very defensive, um, not a lot of damage, but it can hold the line a lot better and maybe even encourage things. Stuff that really kind of gives you a sense of character to the trolls rather than just kind of simply just fat stomachs charging at them and just rubbing their greasy bellies on things, which is it's just vile in its own right. Like, I bet you a troll smells like lard. Spoiled lard. I'm not even happy with what I've just said. So let's move on now to some of the other things like the uh, the campaign mechanics and the starting location, for the love of God. <laughs> so now that we've gone into the units, lords, all that action, let's talk a little bit about faction mechanics, uh, vortex objectives, updates, all that kind of action. And I think the one overarching faction mechanic, or at least I'd say the Vortex objective for Grom the Paunch is going to be the Ulthuan Waystones. And that is something that has to do heavily with the lore of this character as he made his way through Ivris. And in that he kind of was destroying these Waystones. And as we know, the Waystones are what empower the uh, Great Vortex in the center of Ulthuan, the Isle of the Dead. So 
In a way, they will be uh, doing what they can for the Vortex campaign in a direct opposition to the other races. But what I think it's the way that Krom has to be, it's got to be a heavy focus on gathering Waystone fragments to help summon the magic needed to break the Waystones that both ward and protect Ulthwan, which we talked about. And you can't just, you know, smash them with a rock. There's a ritual that's needed. There's there's a, a massive amount of power that needs to go through with it. Uh, if you read the Tyrion and Teclis trilogy, it talks about like, you know, okay, of course a greater demon can do it, but he has a lot of power at his disposal. So I'm thinking maybe like four waystones across Ulthwan. And maybe th there's not, they're not just waystones. Uh, maybe waystones are the currency and there's, these are like waystone... Uh, major waystones or a waystone citadel or keep something like that but these four waystones across ulthwan you need to destroy each one with a harder and harder warden quote-unquote force to deal with although eltharion is the only recorded warden that i know of in the high elf lore there's nothing to say that there are not other ones or there were not other ones at any one time so i'd say the warden of ivris eltharion plays uh, an obvious kind of role in this whole naming mechanic for the forces I've given for these four waystones. Also, I think it'd be a very interesting is as you deal with these waystones, you deal with harder and harder, like, you know, like a high elf defense force, basically that it's sent against you, um, some sort of like high elf militia of some sort. But basically, you kind of get these um, um, I guess separate factions that spawn based off of the total waystones gathered or waystones destroyed, one or the other. And kind of similar to what we get with the Vortex campaign for the major four races, right? Where they need to throw, or the Vortex campaign's mechanic to throw Chaos, Norskin armies at you nonstop, Skaven, depending on if you're playing Lizardmen or not, so on and so forth. So I think that the Ulthwan Waystone mechanic can, in a lot of ways, uh, lend to a similar, I guess, approach to the, the Grander Vortex campaign by just having High Elf or maybe even Dark Elf factions attack you. Like, Dark Elves are trying to uproot you from Ulthwan because they're trying to claim it for themselves. And High Elves are trying to stop you because they know the Waystones will destabilize the Great Vortex. So maybe that's how they add a little variety to the latter portions of the Waystone, I guess, conquest, I guess you could say, is that Dark Elves get involved. Um, you could say Skaven, but Skaven being on Ulthwan doesn't make a whole ton of sense as, like, a random army that pops up out of nowhere. Like, I could understand the motivation there. Um, Chaos could make some sense, or Norskin at least, Norskin Raiders from the north. They realize, okay, that with the Waystones being destroyed, the mists that cover Ulthwan are a little bit less intense, and they can now make a little bit more cogent raids into the center of Ulthwan itself. So, maybe that Norskins are a part of this as well, but... I think it can't just be simply high elves. It does have to have some variety in there. Oops, sorry. It has to have some variety in there. And I think that a, a fun way to do that would be just kind of adding some dark elves, maybe even Norsk and so on and so forth. But I think the destruction of waystones permanently lowers the relations with high elves near the end um, of this whole campaign. All the high elves are going to be declaring war on you, especially as you go through those latter um, two waystones. And I think it, it culminates then with one giant fight at Ivris. Maybe Ivris is, of course, the, the big faction you take out, uh, but I still think that there has to be, like, maybe one last bastion of, uh, of High Elf Hope in Ivris. Even if you've taken it, they, they just, maybe there's some sort of narrative that they can create, or maybe Ivris itself is relatively impregnable unless you have a very advanced force that you can really take it. But I'd say that that's got to be the final battle for Grom is fighting against Eltharion and other High Elf legendary lords at Ivris. And I think that it has to be a very, uh, it's got to be different than what the Ivris or the, the Eltharian version of this mechanic is going to be, which we'll talk about in his section. But I think it's got to be an overwhelming army attacking against um, a very advanced siege that's not just simply, here's a wall, break the wall, get through the wall. I think it's got to be something along the lines of the High Elf Gates and the new Empire um, <clears throat> keeps that, that, that guard the passes into the old world. I think it needs to be something like that. I say a lot of I thinks. I'm making it up, so <laughs> we'll see how it goes. The other thing here, and this is the Greenskins overhaul that I kind of hinted at about, and I don't want to go into too much detail on this because I did an entire video dedicated to it, but there was one, if there was one single thing that I could request for the Greenskins, uh, outside of their obvious faction mechanic getting a change since the WAH system is buggy and clunky, it'd be the roster cleanup. And I think that this is too late in the quote-unquote game to request, but I'd love to see that, or loved if you just recruited orc boys, black orcs, savage orcs, etc. Just the base unit 
Um, one thing that I want to just kind of bring up real quick, if you've never looked at the 8th edition army book for the Greenskins, um, I think it's actually called 8th edition Orcs and Goblins, and if as you look through it, you will see Savage Orcs, you will see Orc Boys, you will see Goblins, you will see Night Goblins, you see all these different iterations of almost every single Lord, every single Hero, every single uh, Core Choice. It's just the way that that book is structured. You have all these different bases of orcs and goblins and an orc boy in a savage orc in a black orc in a goblin and then the different iterations us up night goblins so on and so forth so i think what would be a better way to do this is if you recruited a base unit orc boy black orc savage orc so on and so forth then the ui would show that the unit has what would look like a level if it were a lord or a hero you then jump into a skill tree of sorts where you select the loadout of the unit from a list of pre-generated options. So for instance, you recruit orc boys. And orc boys can have bows, two choppas, choppa and a shield, or spear and shield. And you click it and it locks out the other ones and it's the only option for that character. You can't recycle it. If you want other ones, you just have to remake it and, and choose it again. This way it reduces all the roster bloat, which I think is hard for newer players to deal with. And you have a much cleaner and easier option for each branch of green skin. I think it's just a way easier way to deal with it. You could even say that those that the skill trees themselves are barred by certain buildings need, that need to be produced or researches, um, whatever it needs to be that maybe, okay, you can't make um, orc boys with bows unless you build this building, so on and so forth. And it's a faction wide effect. I think that would maybe be the most make the most sense, or maybe you cannot uh, train that if they're not in a certain province, or something of that sort. But you could even extend this to the multiplayer roster in that you just basically select that unit and then you go through its abilities and you choose the ability or or the item, I guess you could say, for its loadout and it locks out the rest of them. I just think that that's the biggest issue with the green skin is it's very hard to really follow the vast amount of units they have they have access to and cleaning that up, I think is a pretty good idea. Now, that's not to say that there are not a bevy of other things that need to happen to the Greenskins to bring them up to speed to some of the other Total War Warhammer 2 races. Well, let's jump into now the starting locations for what we have. And we'll start with the Vortex map, the first one here. So Sardaneth in Northern Ivris, or the Southern Badlands above Setra, uh, both are very challenging starting locations because you are surrounded by enemies on all sides. But I think that's got to be the overall feeling of Grom is that it is a little bit more challenging. You are stacked against you out the gate, but you have a lot of mechanics, new units that'll help get you, uh, I guess, steamrolling. So Sardaneth puts you up against High Elves, Norskins, and Vampire Coast. Uh, Sardaneth itself are already a set of ruins, so you wouldn't be displacing any other units, or I'm sorry, any other factions in the game. You'd be smack dab right there in between Kothic to the north of you, Ivers to the south, and then to the northeast, you have Albion with all the uh, Norskins. Now, of course, you do also have uh, Aranus Assault Spite as a Vampire Coast from Sartosa down to the southeast. And there's a lot of different options, I think, with Sardaneth. Now, outside of that, if we just move a little bit south, the southern uh, Badlands in Galbaraz, uh, this gives you Savage Orcs to deal with with the uh, Tomb Kings, Vampire Coast, and Bretonians as your next possible targets or at least enemies. Um, but maybe that they're... There can be something here where the Greenskins have a natural affinity to allying with the Tomb Kings, which I'd be very surprised about, but there is a Greenskins unique building already in the game that would help jumpstart his economy in Galbaraz. So I think that that kind of really adds a little credence to this starting location because we know that from the, um, the lore here that the Southlands was pretty much the staging point for uh, the massive army of Grom as it moved its way north through all of uh, the old world and so on and so forth and before pushing off west into Ulthuan. Now of course we don't have access to that level of map. We do on the on the Mortal Empires, but on the Vortex map I think that not making them start directly on Ulthuan is uh, not a bad idea, but I think that making them just in Southern Badlands so they can go right into Ulthuan is good because if their mechanics are very heavily driven towards Ulthwan, then again, you're going to want to get quick access to that. That makes a lot of sense for the Vortex campaign. Now, for the Mortal Empires campaign, we've got two big options as well. Lightwater or the Southern Badlands again. And this one is a bit trickier, and it's really dependent on the faction mechanics for Grom that we were talking about just a second ago. 
If we're again going with that very heavy Ulthuan centric faction mechanic, Southern Badlands makes a bit more sense. Replace the top knots at um, Galbaraz and just have them have an easy springboard into Ulthuan. Um, Blightwater is a bit more lore centric as Grom came out from the Misty Mountains east of the World's Edge Mountains. You know, he'd have a lot of uh, natural opponents and other green skins like the Red Fangs, uh, Karak Azul, and also the Silver Pinnacle, and not to mention Malice, Krokgar, and Snitch on, uh, to his back on the other end of the mountains. Now, another good option, this is a little bit more of a wild card, is Massive Oracle, giving quick access to Ulthuan, but a lot of Bretonians to wade through. This would also help the Bretonian campaign in dealing with Orc incursions because it would give them an Orc incursion to deal with right out the gate that's a little bit... Uh, I guess, legendary lore-driven. Um, it could spice up both of those campaigns in that uh, Massive Orc Halls are really challenging starting location for Grom, and it makes it for a very uh, fun and hard uh, location to push off into Ulthuan for. Additionally, for Bretonia, now you have to deal with a Massive Orc presence in Massive Orc Hall. No, no pun intended. Damn it, I, I realized it as I was saying it. But as a whole, I think that these starting locations make a lot of sense for Grom. Because there are, there are certain locations that are not too crowded, especially on the Mortal Empires map. Uh, not too many lords are right around here, as opposed to a lot of the newer places that we've had lords. And I think it makes for a lot of uh, sense for an easy access into Ulthuan. Lightwater is, again, a little bit more of a challenging start, but it does kind of follow that overall narrative of a, of a Wa Grom pulling from the Misty Mountains all the way into Ulthuan. And I think it's pretty fun. I think that's what kind of what people want. In a Mortal Empires campaign, they want that grand epic tale that spans across multiple continents. And this would definitely be one that would do it for you. So this is going to wrap up our Greenskin section. Let's jump into some High Elves, though, and go into those Lords, those units, those mechanics, and all the kind of fun I have planned for you. And uh, the best, I say, for last, obviously. And here we have our lovely little one-pager here for the High Elves. So taking a look at our legendary Lord options, we've got Eltharian the Grim. Um, obviously this is going to color the name of the faction here. And I think you could just go get away with Ivris. Uh, another option I had was Wardens of Ivris or, uh, Wardens of Ulthuan, something of that sort, but you could just simply name him Ivris and it would be just fine. Um, I think it depends too upon where he would start. If he starts in Ivris, then just name him the faction Ivris. But if you're making him start somewhere else in the Southland, stuff like that, Wardens of Ivris or some sort of name that kind of hints towards that would make a lot of sense. So here we have the High Elves of Ivris. Now again, Eltharion the Grim is going to be that legendary lord. Now the FLC lord options could be Sea Lord Aislinn, which we talked about before in the video prior to this, or it could be the mighty Prince Imric. I think that the fan favorite is Prince Imric over Sea Lord Aislinn. Sea Lord Aislinn was mainly me just talking about a fun, creative, and different lord than what we typically talk about with the High Elves. Prince Imric, in my opinion, though, He's a little bit too easy, right? Uh, all of his items are already in the game. You can make a lord and name him Emric, and it is Prince Emric because the dragon horn is in there, the uh, the the armor of Narian, I think, is his armor. We have the dragon armor of Anarian, what's on Tyrion. But there was also like an armor of Kalidor or of of Anarian, I think, that's on Emric. Uh, but he also has a star lance. I mean, he has all the things that you can just kind of pop onto him and have him be the exact same character. So Emric, I think, is a little too easy in my opinion. But moving now here to the generic Lords and Heroes, we have the Archmage. Um, pretty easy one here. I think that this has to add uh, some additional stuff that we'll go about in his section. But then also a Dragon Mage, which I'm excited to talk to you guys about. Now for units, again, following the same kind of uh, uh, pattern that we did before, the first three I think are going to be the most likely, followed by the last three being a little bit more of like a long shot, but I think a fun addition nonetheless. Uh, White Lion Chariot, uh, we all know I love this one and I've wanted it in there for ages. Uh, War Lions of Trace, which you could call Feral White Lions, but I don't think that fits the High Elf motif, and we'll talk about that then in that section. Uh, the Lothern Skycutter, which is going to be so fun. Uh, I think it would be amazing if they add this to the game. Now, the three more unique ones we have with the Murworm, which we have seen a little hint of, right, when we take a look at the Vampire Coast campaign. Uh, sea Company, which brings swords to the table. And then the Arcane Phoenix, which is a really fun combination of the Frost Heart and the Flame Spire, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. So now that we've talked a little bit about these units, these lords, let's dive in on Eltharian and go through some of the mechanics I have in mind for him. All right, Eltharian the Grim, I think, is easily my favorite character in the High Elves as far as legendary lords 
from the book. Uh, Anarian's probably my favorite High Elf period, but Eltharian the Grim is a badass. He has access to so many things. He is the hybrid lord, and I don't take that word lightly. Uh, he has access to magic, he is a badass combatant, he has a griffin, and he has a longbow. So, I don't know if, if Creative Assembly will give him a longbow, that might be just too much to have on one character, and I think that from Creative Assembly standpoint, when it comes to making these lords, they kind of have to take a look at this and say, okay, what makes the most sense for a narrative that, that people can follow? Okay, if he's a badass fighter, and he's an archer, and he's a, he's a mage, why the hell would I want to play any other character? So I think that maybe not having the longbow added to Altharian the Grim is a way to kind of curb him and make him a little more in line with the other hybrid lords that we have across Total War Warhammer 2. I'm not sure, but kind of a stew on that. I'd love to get your opinion, guys, what you think. Do you think that him having a longbow and just having access to 160 range, what, 300 weapon strength uh, longbow makes a lot of sense, or is it just kind of not really fit in with the lord? I think from a tabletop perspective, it's awesome. It's great to just have a nice little, uh, strong little shot that he can do every so often. But I think from a Total War perspective, it just doesn't really fit how these characters move around the battlefield and how they do things. I think that his bow shots will go off one or twi once or twice, then he'll be in combat or he'll just be casting spells. So uh, let me know again what you think about him having access to his longbow. But for mount options, I could see him on foot to start off, then on Ithilmar barded horse, a chariot, and then at the end, Stormwing, his personal griffin. And the campaign effects for Eltharian can really play heavily into some of the mechanics that are not in this game. Uh, Fear of Elves is a greenskin mechanic that is a part of their codex or their army book. So, why doesn't Eltharian the Grim cause fear to greenskins as part of his faction mechanic? It plays heavily into the fact that he would be fighting a lot of greenskins. That's kind of something that he's always done. He journeyed into the Southlands to go exact vengeance upon the greenskins. So I think that that plays very well into an, an Eltharian the Grim campaign mechanic. And I think as far as units, um, he would focus mainly on Lothurn Skycutters, Silver Helms, and Chariot bonuses. Um, just something that kind of leans more towards a um, cavalry-centric army. When we take a look at someone like Tyrion, right? Tyrion's got access to a lot of benefits for base militia. Alariel gives benefits to a lot of the, the tree spirits. Lithanar is all about those uh, shadow warriors. I think it'd be cool if Eltharion the Grim really gave a good nod and a good bonus to some of those characters that we get that are, or I'm sorry, some of those units that are, are more, you know, cavalry based. Silver Helms, Chariots, Lothar Skycutter we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, because then if they added Imric, then you could just give him bonuses for Dragon Princes. Open shot case. But the nice thing though about Eltharian is he's got three big cool items. The Fang Sword of Eltharian, your first quest item I would say. Uh, magic attacks, weapon strength, melee attack bonuses. Maybe even a passive rank bonus to Princes as they're recruited. Um, something that kind of gives him more credence uh, to his, his title of Warden of Ivris. Now, on that note, the second quest item would be the Helm of Ivris, a uh, physical resist and armor, maybe even a public order bonus. And the reason I'm saying first, second, and third is I'm looking at it as a scale of power. The thing sort of Altharian, I think that's kind of, it needs to happen. That first one, that the, the weapons are usually something that you get first, right? The Helm, kind of just a nice little second touch. But that third one, the Talisman of Hoeth, the third quest item, I think is crucial. Because again, we talked about him being a hybrid lord. And the reason he's a hybrid lord is the Talisman of Hoeth. It makes him a level 2 wizard in the tabletop and gives him access to a school of magic to choose from. So, the way I envision this is that as a, the third quest item is going to be a little bit more advanced in the campaign. Let's just say, what, turn 50, or uh, level 15? It then spawns a quest that you would, that's how you quest items, that you get them as a quest. Um, and at the end of it, the Talisman of Hoeth will grant you access to an entire school of magic, just like we get with Luther Harkin. Luther Harkin gets access to the Lore of Depths, and it's all rank one, right? He doesn't get any high level ranks out of all those things, but he gets access to all of them immediately. That's the way I think the Talisman of Hoeth has to work. And it can be one of two ways high magic or a custom magic kit. Well, I guess you could add a third one in there and say that you can choose the lore of magic for the Talisman of Hoeth and then it locks him into that. Uh, that might be kind of difficult to program though, so I'm not sure how that really works from a Creative Assembly side. But I think that at the very least, 
the Talisman of Hoeth would give Eltharion the Grim access to high magic and its entire, the entire school itself, all the, the entire lore itself, I'm sorry. School of Magic, this is Harry Potter. Um, but that's why I think Eltharion the Grim is going to be so fun. You bring griffins to the table. It's finally a mount option now for princes and for nobles. But they can really kind of sink their teeth deep in on a, a lot of combat that they, I think, miss out on as on a great eagle. Great eagle is not a really awesome combatant compared to a dragon. And the griffin, in my mind, is that stopgap in between them. I mean, hell, the Empire have access to griffins, and we see how they can really kind of contend some of the larger beasts that they can, uh, that other factions can feel. That sums up our legendary lords. Let's jump into our generic one. And my big pick for the generic lord is the Archmage. And I think this is something that's been a long time coming. The majority of people that played 8th edition High Elves, especially in the competitive realm, really went with Archmages. Archmages were very, very strong. I, I used one. And I would use a, uh, a noble alongside him. I did have builds where I chose princes with a lore master of Hoa sometimes. But for the most part, an art mage was an amazing caster. And I think that's something that we really need in Total War Warhammer 2 is that lord level caster that is not techless. So what I'm saying for the art mage is that it would give access to death, fire, and beast magic. Um, I think that those are the last three that we're missing. And fire magic has to come. And we're going to talk about that with our, our generic hero in the Dragon Mage. But I think fire magic has to be added to the High Elves. And I think in addition to that, the only other two missing, missing are Death and Beasts. Let's just square it off. Get them added. Put them in. I think if, if there was only one other lore that, had to be, that could be added with fire, it would be Death Magic. Just because I think Death Magic is a strong magic to use against Greenskins, which already suffer from a lot of leadership issues. Fader Buna is an amazing spell. Uh, Purple Son of Zerius. You know, you have a bunch of awesome things with Death Magic that I think would be a, a very fun addition. and kind of fits the dark and grim, um, I guess you could say, motif or, or decoration of Ivris. Ivris is, is very grim. It is, Eltharion the Grim is, is aptly named for the kingdom he comes from. Ivris is not a fun, cool land. It is very, very, very dark and bleak. So I think Not like Nagarith, but still uh, quite different, actually. A little more sad. <laughs> but I think that adding death magic to the game with Archmage is a great, great way to kind of spice up that magic that Apparently the High Elves have access to all eight lores of magic, but not in Total War Warhammer. Um, so I'd love to see those added to the game. Now our generic hero option is pretty easy, the Dragon Mage. Now, this was a hero unit from the 8th edition that rides a sun dragon and has access to fire magic. And it has to be on a dragon. So I'd say that this is more of a higher tier hero, but with a higher value, obviously, because you're getting a sun dragon out of it. It's not something you can summon up in the very first initial tier 3, tier 4 buildings. It might be required of a tier 5 building that um, maybe requires you to have the base building for dragons as well as the max tier for all of the mages in order to even get one of these guys out. Because then you have access again to fire magic and to sun dragons. And this is why I say that the archmage has to have fire magic if the dragon mage does. You're not going to just add fire magic and not give it to the Archmage, who can cast more spells than a Dragon Mage. And Dragon Mages have this very interesting lore behind them, wherein they are a little bit more uh, hot-headed, and that's why they are using the lore of magic, or fire magic, because it kind of pays um, a lot of respects to the way that they personally approach warfare. They're not, you know, they're not very hands-off, they're very hands-on, hence being on a Sun Dragon, looking to just bring some uh, some fury right to the foe. I think the Dragon Mage is a really cool addition to the, to the game, um, more so than I think the Anointed of Assyrian, which is a pretty uh, easy kind of hero unit, which is just basically a Phoenix Guard spruced up. But I think the Dragon Mage adds a lot more fun to the, uh, to the game. Well, let's move into some of those units, because I think that's the one thing that people most look forward to in a DLC is new fun units. units. The first one, of course, being the White Lion Chariot. Now, this is, I think, different than what we get with the other elf, that includes Dark Elves, chariot units. I don't think there's going to be any range on this guy. Get him a, give him a high charge bonus, high armor, missile resist, and give him a melee AP anti-infantry style chariot that's just going to just bulldoze through something. You kind of want something more akin to the Gore Beast chariot. Maybe a little bit slower than the Ithlamar chariot, but I want this thing to be really have a high punch and push through things hard and heavy. It causes fear maybe because it has white lions, war lions attached to the front of it that are rending and ripping their way through foes. And I think that this is a chariot 
that needs to, um, or maybe not needs to, but I, I think that it can get away with being in combat a little bit longer than your standard chariot. It, I, it, it has these war lions pulling it, why not have it have a little bit more staying power, either more melee defense or, again, that higher armor that allows it to kind of stay in combat a little bit longer than your normal chariot, which can get mulched up pretty quick if you don't pull it in and out of uh, combat after a beat or two. I think the White Lion Chariot is one, is one that people have been wanting for a long time, and it's a way to really kind of capitalize on the chariot option for the High Elves, which I think is completely lacking, especially compared to the new Dark Elf Scourge Runner Chariot, which is just aces all around. I mean, that thing is so strong, and was recently showcased in that Top 5 Dark Elf video I did. Or uh, Top 5 Dark Elf units. <laughs> but the White Lion Chariot, I think, is, is one that needs to be added to the game if nothing else on this list is added. Playing off of the White Lion Chariot, though, are the other option here for the War Lions of Trace. Now, I would say that this could be just called Feral White Lions, but I don't think that plays very well into the way the High Elves kind of um, pursue war, or at least the martial mastery that they kind of go about things. They're not going to just throw a bunch of White Lions and like uncage them and say, hey, have at it, go ahead and rip their throats out and let's see how it goes. Once you get a taste for human blood, don't kill me. I mean, I just don't think that's the way White Lions would be. So instead, I see these being War Lions of Trace and having them have higher leadership than what we typically see with a Feral unit. Uh, that's always kind of been the trade-off, right? If you have a Feral X, Carnosaur, Stegodon, I know it's not that, um, uh, har not Feral Harpies, a Feral Wyvern, a Feral Manticore, it always has a low leadership, right? Because there's nothing really behind it. I think the War Lions of Trace would be a, an actual trained unit that does have a good substantial leadership and it does kind of... Uh, cater to the whims of, of its masters a little bit better. So I, I look at this as kind of a smaller pack of anti-infantry skirmisher cav. 36 unit size, same size as say, you know, Norskin Ice Wolves. Uh, you could maybe give them magic attacks in the same way that Norskin Ice Wolves have frostbite, something to kind of give them a little bit more punch, or maybe even in lieu of magic attacks, just AP because they're fucking lions. So I think the white, the War Lions of Trace would be a really, really fun addition to the to the uh, the roster. Our next unit is one that I think is another big shoe in because it is also missing from the Eighth Edition Warhammer Army book in the Lothern Skycutter. Now this thing is very awesome. I look at it as a mobile artillery platform. Um, I I kind of wrestled with this in my brain. Is it a unit of three or is it a single entity? I think that a single entity makes the most sense for this thing because it's essentially a bolt thrower on the move. Um, I would say it has fire whilst moving, vanguard, a 360 firing arc because basically this, this bolt thrower is on a pivot and it can kind of move around as, as it so wishes. At the same time though, it's going to have a shorter range than a normal bolt thrower. The bolt thrower on the sky cutter was not an eagle claw bolt thrower, it was a smaller version thus of. So I think that that's how you kind of balance it out. It's a shorter range bolt thrower. Um, on a single entity flying artillery platform, which is really cool, really thematic, and very different. We don't have anything like this aside from the gyrocopter and bomber from the dwarfs. And, and a way you could also do this as well is have one that is a uh, Lothar and Sky Cutter, let's just say uh, a bolt thrower that's more anti-infantry, and you have a different one that's more anti-large. So that way you don't have the ability to flex into both situations, kind of helping to curve them back a little bit in their power creep. You don't want this thing to be, okay, well, it's flying, Vanguard, Firewheel's moving, got a 355 million, million range, like it kind of has to have some downsides and maybe that's the downside. It doesn't, it can't switch its modes. You have to just choose a whole different sky cutter if you want it to be anti-large. The fourth unit on our list is a little underwhelming, but I think it's something that could make a lot of sense for the High Elves, and that's the C Company. I look at them as just simply sword infantry, silver shields, low armor clone to the spearmen. Nothing crazy here, it's just the opposite of what you get with, say, the uh, the bleak swords. And it's, it's just because we don't have them in a roster for the High Elves, and I always found that as a weak point in the High Elf roster in, in Tabletop and in Total War Warhammer. And the C Company, I think, is a really great way to kind of fill that in, because in this game, yeah, the spearmen can really hold the line, they can do just fine, um, but I think that not having those those sword infantry or that sword infantry is is actually kind of a bit of an achilles heel for the lower tier one versions of the high elves obviously you're going to want to swap them out for sword masters of hoath in a campaign where you can just spam tons of them but i think that it's it takes a little time to get to it and as a result i think the c company kind of shores up 
the um, the the offensive capabilities of the beginning portions of a high elf campaign in a pretty fun way. Um, you could even make these guys the regiment renowned version of 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 um, Miss Walkers of Ivris, uh, which doesn't say that they're swordsmen, but still, you could have a lot of fun with that. Um, you could even do another regiment renowned in an Ivris theme. Since we've talked about so much trace stuff, I feel like since we're on Altharian, we should talk about some Ivris things. Another good one would be just kind of a Griffin Rider regiment. And that could simply be a regiment of renowned Silver Helms. That is a smaller unit count, but riding Griffins. Much like we get with the, um, oh, what's the name of them? Not the Heralds of the Wind. Dark Heralds? The Dark Riders that are riding uh, Dark Pegasi. So that's the kind of, uh, that's, that's where my, my, my brain is on that, is why not give an, a similar thing to the High Elves where it's the Silver Helms on top of these Griffins. I think it'd be a really great way to kind of tie in Ivris, tie in the Sea Company into all of that. All right, let's talk about some big boys. Let's talk about that Murr Worm. And I know a lot of you guys have wanted this since it came out in Vampire Coast. And a lot of people have said it would make a lot of sense if this came with like a Sea Lord Aislinn pack or something of the sort. But Murr Worm, I look at it as this large Dread Saurian style creature. Uh, give it poison attacks, high missile resistance, and an enfeebling cold aura similar to the Frostheart Phoenix, but maybe not Winds of Magic bound. Um, in the Monstrous Arcanum, there were three different versions of the Murrworm, like a Paggle Worm and so on and so forth. I'm saying just take all their abilities and roll it into one onto the Murrworm. Poison attacks, uh, the, I think it was called the Astral Cloak or, or Abyssal Cloak, which is given basically missile resistance more or less, and the other one which gave it a, a kind of cold enfeebling aura around it. Wrap it all up, put it on a package, make, make it the Murrworm, and have that thing just stalk the land and attack things in its big huge tail, just swatting them down. I see this thing as a very large creature on the battlefield. And again, I think playing into a lot of these large creatures that we get from the Monstrous Arcanum is a great way to push Little War Warhammer into a whole different realm that the tabletop could never really touch because of just the way that Forge World worked and the way that Monstrous Arcanum worked and things coming out at different times. All sorts of weird shit. You don't have those constraints in a computer game. But I think that jumping into this stuff really makes a lot of sense. All right, our sixth unit, our, our last one here. And this one is a total wild card, but I think a really fun and really unique, the Arcane Phoenix. So this is a Phoenix, again, for the Monstrous Arcanum, and it brings a lot of cool mechanics to the Phoenix quote-unquote class of Beast. And I think that the Phoenixes are a really awesome portion of the High Elf roster. I had two in my army on tabletop. I love using them in the High Elf campaign. Not so great in multiplayer, but still, I, I love them as a whole. But what they really do is they bring the durability of the Frost Heart with bound abilities like the Flamespire um, Phoenix to the table. They kind of smash it together. And they have one called Ember Storm. And the way that this works is essentially in tabletop, you draw a line, you do damage in a line. So the way I look at this is a bound wind style ability that locks the Phoenix into a set movement path, but drops Flamespire Phoenix bombs in that path. Take a look at the Skaven Plague Furnace and how it has Pestilent Breath as a bound ability that shoots out from the actual uh, model itself and any any radius around it, but it has to be in at, from the model's base. That's how Ember Storm works in my mind. You have a wind spell that starts at the uh, the base of the Phoenix and it can go in any direction around the Phoenix, but it has to start at its base. And when you do it, the Phoenix then launches in that direction, dropping Flamespire Phoenix bombs in a path. I think it's a really cool way to kind of add a, a very diverse and different um, approach to the Amber Storm ability that isn't just simply a wind spell that you just drop down and it does damage. Um, I think it's different too because the Flamespire Phoenix bomb ability is strong, but it can be very tedious because it's not bound to a um, to a, a, a hotkey. You have to click it itself and it has recycle time. So this allows you to carpet bomb basically in a path without having to manually press your way through it. Uh, the other ability they've got is Plumage of Flame, which is an aura that it reduces melee attack and increases missile defense. At least that's how I compute it from uh, the Monstrous Arcanum. And then they also have Fiery Rebirth. And what makes this all so interesting to me is that the, the Arcane Phoenix is considered like the right hand of Assyrian. They, they, they are the I guess, patron animal of Assyrian. They're, they're most associated with him. And anytime there's a drastic shift in the Winds of Magic, Arcane Phoenixes can be seen throughout Ulthuan. Not like in rampant numbers like fucking bunnies, but still, they, they do make appearances when there's a drastic shift in the Winds of Magic. 
And what better <laughs> display of a drastic shift of Winds of Magic than the Vortex campaign itself, which is about destabilizing the Vortex in the center of Ulthuan, which would make a huge cascade of Winds of Magic throughout the entirety of the world. Makes a lot of sense for them to come in from a lore perspective if you think of it that way. So our last ability here would be, in my mind, uh, stacking buffs, similar to what you get with the Black Coach, because they've got Cleansing Flames, Omen of Hope, Omen of Sacrifice, and the Blessings of Assyrian. And these are all different abilities that you can choose, and I think that that's a little boring when it comes to this character or this unit. I think a great way to kind of do this is, again, just like we get with Black Coach or the Frenzy ability from Norska, um, or uh, the Fury ability of, of Norska, sorry. I think that this makes a lot of sense because it's fun, it's different, and it's a great way to keep Phoenixes in the fight. So as they stay in combat, Cleansing Flame kicks off. All right, that's a boost to your weapon strength. An Omen of Hope, which gives the, the Arcane Phoenix encourage. So it's going to encourage everything that it's around. Then it's next thing, Omen of Sacrifice. Okay, now the Arcane Phoenix has Frenzy. And the last one, Blessings of Assyrian, is going to grant him a ward save. So as this thing is staying in combat, it's going to get Weapon Strength, then Encourage, then Frenzy, then eventually a ward save to help out its durability. And I think that at the end of it, of course, obviously, if it dies, it has a chance to come back with Fire Rebirth, jumping back onto all these benefits. I think the Arcane Phoenix is a total wild card, and I do not think it actually would get added to the game. But I think that it would be such an awesome uh, uh, creature to put into the High Elf roster because it has so many different and unique ways of combining the Frost Heart and Flamespire Phoenix. That way you kind of have these two awesome Phoenix characters put into one in a really cool way. And maybe it's bound to a quest or a certain thing or a right even that you can only get one um, at a time or something like that because it's so strong, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of ways to balance this thing out. But I think at the end of the day, it's a very fun, unique uh, unit for the High Elves. So now that we've gone through the units of the High Elves, let's talk about the faction mechanics and vortex objectives for a proposed Ivris faction with Hotharian the Grim. And basing them on the Ulthorn Waystones is probably a pretty good bet. Uh, similar to the Greenskins, Eltharian would be geared towards rebuilding and holding the Waystones, while, you know, of course, the Greenskins are geared towards destroying them. So what if this were to happen in three stages? So stage one, retake High Elf lands. Uh, stacking bonuses for turns hell, holding the province of Iv Ivris with constant orc attacks. That would be a really interesting mechanic here. Is rather than dealing with the actual Vortex campaign, you deal with um, constant in orc incursions onto your territory. And if you're holding Ivris, you basically get more um, bonuses for the amount of, let's just say, intervals of turns. So, okay, if you're holding it for 10 to 20 turns, this is your bonus. 20 to 30, so on and so forth. So as long as you hold the whole entire province of Ivris, and for as long as you do, you will get stacking bonuses. And if they do take any of those, okay, then that whole thing resets. You lose your bonuses. You're back down to stage one or um, to uh, square one. But after a certain point, let's just say you you have accrued enough, um, or you've rebuilt enough waystones using waystone fragments. I haven't really thought out that part as well, like how you get to these individual stages. But what if then stage two? is pursuing a war against the Greenskins. You get a lot of faction bonuses that give you melee attack, weapon strength, whatever, or fear to the Greenskins. Again, playing off of Eltharian the Grimm's fear mechanic. Um, just a way that you are pursuing this against the Greenskins. You're pushing now down into the Badlands, or I'm sorry, the Northern Badlands. Or it's the Northern Southlands, but the province is the Southern Badlands. <laughs> You're pushing into that and attacking the Greenskins, trying to destroy um, a certain amount, to try to reap a certain tally. And again, you're dealing with <clears throat> increased orc incursions or you're dealing with orc um, armies that are starting to pour up into uh, Ulthwan. So you have to destroy them on your way down. And the final stage would be a massive Wa defense against Ivris. And um, my concept for this is that you have one army that you basically have to weather the 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 board <laughs> for a certain period of time. Let's just say 15 minutes. And every five minutes, you get a small um, reinforcement that comes in. Oh, we, we, reinforcements have come in from Kothic. Uh, a, a contingent of Swordmasters of Hoeth and a Mage have come in from Hoeth. 
you maybe get little tiny bonuses depending on your relations with other factions while you, uh, you know, pursue your war against the Greenskins. So it's a way to kind of get involved with the other factions of Ulthuan without taking over Ulthuan, which has just become so um, so much the centerpiece for every single High Elf campaign. And while you can do that, I think that that's just not as big of a focus for my speculation, at least. Uh, it might be that if Creative Assembly puts Eltharion the Grim into the game, they just say, okay, well, he is on the Vortex campaign, he has to retake Ulth Ulthuan like everyone else does. Sure, fine. I'm just playing with some fun, different ways to go about this that quite honestly, might not make any goddamn sense. But I think it's a different way to look at this campaign than it is your typical get some waystone fragments, stabilize the portal, everything's good. So those are my that's my kind of take on the Ulthuan waystone portion of this. Now, I think that a special or specific right could be accessible for uh, Eltharian, and that's the right of Ladriel. And Ladriel is Lady of the Mists, the, the, the goddess of the mists, and has a lot to do with Ivris. So this, in my mind, gives attrition to anyone in any of the provinces owned by Ivris, um, Vanguard deployment style kind of right for Ivris. You know, we get this plenty of times. We get this in the Vampire Coast, we get this in the Tomb Kings. Plenty of factions have a right just like this. And I think it makes a lot of sense if you're defending Ivris and you're trying to put attrition onto all these orc incursions, right of Ladriel, boom, they deal with attrition and you get a lot of Vanguard deployment to really jump out of the mists and attack these things. That's part of Ivris's defensive tactics is using the mists to their advantage to spring up and surprise and ambush their foes. That's how, that's how I really kind of envision that. Now, before we jump into the starting locations, which is going to be pretty quick, um, I want to go into probably what is the biggest chunk of the High Elf portion, and that is the Intrigue and Court rework. It needs to be just completely overhauled from the ground up. I'm sorry. It has a really cool principle, and it plays very heavily into the way the High Elves kind of deal with their court system in the Phoenix Court, and I really like it. I think that um, my initial thought for this was that why not give the, the High Elves a Phoenix Court and have it very similar to the Empire's court system. In fact, you could just port it over, and you can appoint um, princes of the respective kingdoms. You could do that. There's my there. There's there's like a one or two three sentence thesis on a real quick little uh, or I'm sorry two two sentence summary on something you could do uh, that's quick and easy and throw away. But I think a different way to do the intrigue and court system is that it needs that again that total overhaul. And I think that the best way to do it is to take a lot of the cool features we got with the clan Eshen clan Eshen mission system. Uh, you can even break intrigue and court between two types of missions: internal and external. And it goes without saying uh, certain uh, campaign dilemmas would be external or internal focus with corresponding either gold or influence costs to complete. But internal missions are geared towards using influence to increase public order, trade influence, recruitment cost reduction, local recruitment capacity increase, reduce construction costs, etc. Essentially using your influence to further expand or reinforce your realms. Um, top tiers of internal missions can spawn maybe... Um, High Elf Militia Forces, that's a full 20 stack that you can control for 10 turns that spawns at your faction leader, perhaps. I, I don't know, I I'm kind of spitballing here. But external missions are geared towards hindering or boosting everyone else. The biggest problem with this is that Warhammer 2 suffers from a rather weak diplomacy system. So Intrigue and Court would circumvent that by outright breaking the rules of the existing diplomacy system. So you can use intrigue to either force two factions into war or peace outright. No, like, okay, well, I'm going to increase their their favor or or get them mad at each other. No, no, no. You can just outright create a proxy war, more or less. Kind of like what you get with uh, Sao Sao in uh, Three Kingdoms. But imagine having the ability to also declare war on factions without it affecting your reliability, regardless of treaties. So if you have a non-aggression pact, you just get a war going them. I mean, the elves are always finding a lot of reasons for their actions abroad, oftentimes claiming some sort of you know, multi-century old claim to a location to serve their own benefits. We see that happening in the lore all over the place. So it makes a lot of sense that they could just do this. Like, oh, yeah, we might have a trade agreement and a military alliance, but I'm going to use 100 influence and declare war on you. 
Um, this can then expand out to spying on enemies to see their territory, uh, using intrigue to open up settlement gates, you know, a la some of the other Total War games and how the agents can pop open the gates before a siege. I think bringing that back would be so huge. Uh, force diplomatic actions like trading, like force it. Like, yeah, you might have, maybe uh, the threshold is as long as they are neutral or above, like zero or above, you can force um, a trading partnership with another faction, which then, of course, gives you sight into that faction because of the high elf mechanic of sight on uh, trading partners. But certain modifiers would have to be considered. But overall, the goal would be to break the diplomacy system by using your intrigue to countermand certain scenarios. And I think that that's what would make intrigue in court useful. I mean, right now, it's kind of just, uh, I'm trying to boost this guy to a point where I can um, confederate with him because he's another high elf. I think making Intrigue in Court something that can actually benefit you or absolutely help you kind of create a wall between your your big opponent and yourself by having that opponent fight someone else, I think is a really awesome way to kind of have High Elves pulling the strings. Remember, High Elves believe very heavily in Intrigue in Court. That is a, is a line directly from the book, is Intrigue in, Cook, in Court. And they don't believe in the direct kind of... Um, lethal or martial action that the dark elves take they're all about pulling the strings about being manipulative deceitful um whatever it takes to kind of get things accomplished but as long as it doesn't result in actual physical violence to other elves so it's a very interesting kind of line that they tow when it comes to the intriguing court system that i think really needs to be pushed into the game by again like breaking that diplomacy system all right, now for our last portion on the high elves before we close out this section and bring our video to a close is the starting location and honestly, this can be very easily done with just simply Ivris and the Vortex campaign. I think there's room enough for one final High Elf Lord on the eastern outer ring of Ulthuan. Uh, it makes the most sense as Eltharion was the Warden of Ivris and came to the defense of Tor Ivris as it was besieged by Grom the Paunch. My initial thought when I, I first kind of conceptualized doing this video two, three months ago was that uh, Eltharion the Grim would start in the elven ruins uh, where Sutenberg is, right to the east of Ark in the Black. Well, now with Clan Eshin starting there, well, they've kind of split it. Sutenberg is now in those elven ruins and in Sutenberg proper, and Eshin is smack dab in between them. So it doesn't make any sense to put Eltharion the Grim there, which I am very sad to say. <laughs> uh, Eltharion the Grim has a, a big expedition into the Southlands and the Badlands. Very much like Prince Imric. Prince Imric does the same thing. There are uh, He does little uh, Southlands uh, trouncing about. So I, I thought it would be such an amazing shoe in that the Elven Ruins is eventually just replaced with uh, the Wardens of Ivris or the Expedition of Ivris or, or Eltharian's Wet and Wild Adventure. Whatever the hell the name of the faction is going to be if it is added. So I think that that not being um, a viable option kind of shot... Uh, uh, my idea in the foot of him starting in the Southlands. Now, I, I don't really have many good ideas for where he could, start, he could start. He could start opposite Clan Eshin on that little uh, peninsula right there, but then he's right up against Lizardmen, um, which could make sense, right? That, that, that could be a really fun start for them. But I think that as a whole, depending on the campaign mechanics and, and the narrative of this campaign, having him just start in Ivris just makes the most sense. And you can extend that out into the Mortal Empires as well. Having him start in Ivris, again, makes the most sense. Um, he could start in the Southlands on Mortal Empire, since there are so many options between the Southlands and the Badlands. You could have him start, well, where, where uh, we were saying that um, mighty mighty uh, uh, Grom the Paunch could start, right? You could put him in Galbaraz, if you so wish, on the on the Mortal Empire's map, if, if Grom is in Blightwater. But it just kind of depends on how these mechanics will influence the Lord, because that's what I think truly dictates where their starting position is going to be. But overall, I think the High Elves have so many unique and different things that can be added to the game. And I'm really excited for what would possibly come with another High Elf DLC. Um, you guys know that the High Elves are my favorite race, hands down. And I've really kind of spitball with you guys with three things that I think are big, huge, needed additions. in the White Lion Chariot, Wilderness Sky Cutter, and the War Lions of Trace. I think they just kind of make a lot of sense. The Murrworm, the Sea Company, the Arcane Phoenix, those are things that I, I've always thought would be amazing in a High Elf roster. And I really wanted to bring them up in this video here to kind of help you guys kind of join my, my brain soup on this one. <laughs> to have a little fun with me on this. Because we don't know if or what we would get in a DLC like this. And I think that 
uh, Creative Assembly has shown us that they can really break the mold and do whatever the hell they want when it comes to a DLC or an FLC. Uh, I mean, who would have ever thought Rapunz? Who would have ever thought a Dread Sarian? Sotek and I were talking about this. Loremaster Sotek and I were talking about that. We never ever would have guessed either of those units in this game, period. So I think that things being dead, which they have said is not a, a hindrance, and things that are in the Monstrous Arcanum are all just viable options to any roster. And I was really excited to kind of share this one with you guys because I think it was a, it has a, a lot of from my own heart type of experience as far as tabletop and, and things I've always kind of had as a, a personal with a personal wish list. <laughs> And with that, that brings this video to a close here today, guys. Hopefully you had fun going through my speculation for what a High Elf and Greenskin DLC would look like. How Eltharian the Grim or Grom the Paunch could be added into the game. Maybe this will be the Prince and the Paunch. Maybe this will be the Grim and the Grom or the Warden and the Wa or whatever kind of alliteration and consonants Creative Assembly wants to go with for this one. But I'm really excited for whatever we get in 2020. Um, again, we do know that Greenskin update is coming in early 2020, and hopefully it is right alongside the High Elves, which have not had a DLC since the Queen of the Crone. But I'd love to hear what you guys think about some Greenskin or High Elf mechanics, units, legendary lords, starting locations, all that fun stuff that we covered in this video. Go ahead and let me know in the comments below what you would really love to see in a DLC like this or a DLC of your own making. Maybe it's the High Elves and someone else entirely. High Elves and Vampire Counts. Maybe it's... Please God, no, don't, don't, don't say Vampire Counts. <laughs> Maybe it's the Greenskins and the Warriors of Chaos. And it's Grimgore just completely headbutting Archeon in the dick. Who knows what it's going to be? But as always, guys, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this, uh, this little romp here today. Have a good one and take care.